glance. And um, I think I, I think this is an area where um, you know, in some in some parts of the country, we've been kind of pushing this for a long, long time. For other parts of the country, there's been a little bit of hold off. Um, and I don't think that it needs to be an all or nothing. I think it can. I think it can be kind of part of our practice as designers, as gardeners, as master gardeners, as we communicate to the, to the community. Um, and and just so this is just more to generate this. This will be fairly informal. We'll just do this kind of as a way to generate ideas and discussion. Uh, let's see. Are you going to work for me, please? There we go. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit, we'll do a little introduction, um, talk a little bit about sustainable landscape design and kind of narrow down what that focus will be like. Um, then we'll look at some, some examples of kind of how we use it and then um, like a kind of a case study on, on native plants. So the image you see before you is from the Llano Estacado. And um, for many of you, maybe you know what that plant is. Um, cotton, cotton is king on, uh, on the South Plains of the United States. And the reason I have this image here is um, much of our, our prairies are kind of, are currently under cultivation. And so we have some issues as far as uh, like the future of our agricultural production with relation to pollinators and things like that. And so part of what I will talk about with our native plant discussion is the role that our native plants in our gardens and our, in our uh, private landscapes can do to help with our agricultural production um, since that becomes such an important piece. So, you know, what is a sustainable landscape? And I think that's one of those things where it depends on who you ask, uh, what constitutes a sustainable landscape. I think one of the definitions I like is from the Sustainable Sites Initiative. And that is simply that a sustainable landscape appreciates in value over time. So the image you see there is from a native plant nursery just down the road from that cotton field. And if we think about the biodiversity that's happening and the amount of like pollinator activity at this nursery versus on that cotton field, it's pretty significant. Um, and again, like we are, I'm not, this isn't about like not planting cotton, for example, but this is just, it's just understanding that this landscape will continue to appreciate value um, as far as ecosystem services are concerned over time. So that appreciation of value comes about through the fact that plants and trees grow, which is something that is not new to any of us on this call, but it's, it's kind of what happens as those plants grow. So within the last 10 or 15 years, they've done some pretty good work at quantifying the monetary value of mature trees on real estate, which is great, you know? So within cities and suburbs, we have monetized that value of trees. Um, but what, what people don't always realize, and, and I think won't be new to all of you on this call, is that as those, those plants, those trees, shrubs, grasses, forbs, and so forth, mature, the quality of the soil improves, right? So they break up things like compaction, they bring in exudates of sugars and things like that and help form these relationships with mycorrhizae at the roots. Habitat develops, right? So when we first plant something, I always tell my students, nothing looks worse in landscape than the first day it's put in. In architecture, it's the complete opposite. The building never looks better than it does on its first day. But for our discussion in terms of sustainable landscape design and native plants, that habitat development does take time. And so that only gets better and better and better. People are nurtured by these environments. So when we think about like how you know, how people feel when they go to the Smoky Mountains or when, you know, when they, they go for a hike. Um, these environments, these like kind of functioning ecosystems provide all kinds of opportunity for people that, that help deal with stress, help deal with anxiety, all those kinds of things like that. And even the United Nations has, has acknowledged the fact that healthy ecosystems are essential for the health and well-being of all life on this planet. So some of the basics of sustainable landscape design really tie strongly to the idea of native and appropriate plants. Now I want to make a, a point here. My focus is primarily on native plants um, and ecosystem services and ecologically driven design, but I'm not opposed to appropriate plants. And so I'm often asked well, what, what constitutes an appropriate plant. And so my first rule of thumb is an appropriate plant must be a plant that can grow in the, in the, ecosystem we're, we're working in, right? So if I'm working with a client in the Chihuahuan Desert, that plant has to be able to, to live there without, with, with minimal inputs, 
if I'm working in um, Virginia, it's got to live there with minimal inputs. The second piece of it is that it can't be invasive. Um, I have a pretty strong feeling about this. I understand some people, people don't, but prior to making the career shift to, to design, I, I worked as a restoration ecologist. And I've seen kind of firsthand the, the impacts of invasive species on ecosystems and on biodiversity. And so what I think often happens is that folks who are primarily interested in plants as ornamental objects, that's not necessarily horticulturists, so don't, don't get me wrong there, but like, but even architects and landscape architects who primarily look at plants as, as objects they can place and design in a landscape aren't really involved with the natural resource management side of things or um, looking at like biodiversity questions. And so it's not that they, it's not that they wouldn't agree if they knew, but they just aren't even part of that discussion. So I think that's kind of why I push very hard for the idea that an appropriate plant can't be invasive. It can't really cause um, an additional cost, right? So if I'm a rancher in Montana and somebody's got yellow star thistle, that's causing me an additional cost, which kind of automatically eliminates the sustainability portion of that plant. We want to uh, not use potable water. So um, if you think about it, like, you know, plants don't particularly want water that's been treated to drinking quality either, but that's not a very sustainable solution. So we want to try and eliminate potable, the use of potable water. We'd like to use locally sourced and sustainable materials wherever possible, both to reduce something like our carbon footprint, but also to support local economies whenever possible, because again, that's part of like the, the kind of sustainability ethic. We want to reduce water consumption in general. So the use of things like, like rainwater, rainwater harvesting, um, or even things like rain gardens where we're really just storing the water in the ground are all very helpful to do that. We're always looking to improve the ecosystem services. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And we're designing for resiliency. So ecosystem services are the goods and services that healthy ecosystems provide people, right? And so when we think about it, you know, things like uh, air and water cleaning are pretty obvious. Um, water and pollination are important, but also education, aesthetics, and spirituality. You know, when we think about an ecosystem, um, the ability to educate out of that ecosystem, whether they be the children, college kids, doesn't really matter, that's really important, but also, also aesthetics, right? We, we, do, we do appreciate beauty. We want to be able to see beauty that matters. The image you see there is from Rail Yard Park in Santa Fe, New Mexico. This is a post-industrial site. Um, that has been turned over to a city park in Greenway, um, utilizing all native plants. And the, the B Hotel you see there is done with industrial leftover materials and a gabion wall um, to kind of add to that, that aesthetic. Castle right there, um, about to be smashed by teaching face-to-face -face with COVID. <laughs> and so my hope is 2021 ends up a little bit better, um, but but this is typically what we think of when we're talking about um, designing for resilience. And that is the idea that we want to be thinking about um, flood, flood regimes, wildfire regimes, natural disaster regimes. And the use of native plants are helpful in that regard because they've kind of evolved in those places and they've evolved with those conditions. Um, Oftentimes when we think about designing for resilience, I think a lot of people come to the kind of landscape architectural scale. Um, this was a project that was done uh, by my wife and some students at Texas Tech University um, for the EPA stormwater challenge competition. And it was looking at like how to capture stormwater from parking lots and buildings um, to reach a certain, a certain number. But what I wanna draw your attention to, it's still plant driven. So even though it looks really in depth, and it, and it is, it's still, we're really just looking at a giant rain garden. And so what I really want to challenge, um, you know, our, our master gardeners with is the idea that like scale is just size. That's all it is. And so how we treat something as small as a courtyard garden or something as large as a college campus are really similar. They're just, it, we just have to adjust for that size. Um, so they shouldn't be intimidating. So whether we're dealing with, let's say a college campus a residential site, a commercial site like a hotel or even a gas station or a um, dry cleaners or a botanic garden, it's, it's all going to be the same thing and we can utilize these same ideas um, in that. 
So the benefits we have with native plants really tie closely to things like the fact that they're regionally appropriate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there is the aesthetic value of those plants. They elicit a human uh, emotional response and that they, they give context to the design. Um, so the example we have here is a madrone uh, growing at um, Guadalupe Peak National Park. And, um, and so the, the result of that is that like this looks very much like that space. Um, and so that's, you know, that kind of draws that connection to a visitor of, the, of that area. Everything okay? Just make sure. Okay. So the example we have here is feather dahlia. And if we look at feather dahlia, one seed juniper, and these like bunch grasses, this could be easily Southern Colorado, this could be Utah, this could be Arizona, New Mexico, West Texas, any number of those places. But when we design with this in a client's garden or in our own gardens, we're able to create those spaces that draw that emotional connection to those places. This is close, this is near and dear to my heart. This is where I grew up in central Texas. So when we look at things like prairie, uh, prairie paintbrush, blue bonnets, ash juniper, mesquite, and kidney wood, those kinds of things draw a really strong reaction from people. People come from all over the world to take pictures in the wildflower meadows that are along the highways out there. But what I wanna draw your attention to is that this is a designed landscape. So while these plants occur there naturally and they're native to that area, Part of uh, Lady Bird Johnson's initiative when, when LBJ was, was president was to, to increase the use of native plants and wildflowers along our roadways nationally, in Texas in particular. And so TxDOT has made uh, seeding these, these easements with wildflowers a key component to how they treat those roads. And as a result, they've designed a landscape that people appreciate, love, and go to visit. This area right here, if we look at this, we've got these volcanic soils. Um, we've got pine, we've got uh, rabbit bush. This is in Flagstaff, Arizona, out, or uh, outside of Flagstaff, Arizona at Sunset Crater. And again, these are places where people go to travel to see and have strong connections to. And these are places that can provide inspiration for how we design or manage our landscapes back at home or for clients. This would be another example, right? So, so part of the reason I'm showing these kind of these kind of extreme examples is because it's just so clear and easy to see where they're at. This example here is from southern New Mexico on the Mexico border, um, western side towards Arizona. We have Ocotillo. We have multiple species of prickly pear, Apuntia. We have creosote bush, mesquites, things like that. This kind of design and these kinds of these kinds of materials really tie that to the site, but they're also incredibly sustainable within that context. If we were trying to grow things like uh, fescue grass or boxwoods, that would people do unfortunately try to do that, but they they're never very successful and they use a lot of resources to do that. And then we have these examples, and these examples I would say are relatively context neutral meaning that these plants could be from anywhere, right? In some cases, they are native to the places they're at, but the, the, they don't give any clue to where the landscape is necessarily located. And again, that's not necessarily bad, but it's good to kind of understand that if we're going for a certain level of impact, we may not get it. You know, if we plant plants from China or Japan or Korea in Eastern Tennessee, like in, in Knoxville, right? It doesn't give me any context that I'm in Knoxville necessarily, it could be anywhere. And so that's kind, of, that's kind of part of that issue. One of the things we miss when we do that is the fact that there are synergies of plant communities, right? And so this gets into the, the kind of biology and ecology of how plants and populations work together. And so if you're familiar with planting in a post-wild world, you know, Rayner and West kind of utilize the same argument in their approach to planting design. But that is simply that plants morphologically have different shapes, which is obvious to us. We, we see that when we repot something, we've seen its root structure and what have you. But those, those plants assemble together in such a way that they avoid com competing with each other, but still fill space, right? So traditionally what we've done is we've planted plants far enough away from each other and then used mulch to kind of fill in the gaps to keep them from competing. And 
while that works, it doesn't bring about the most ecological function that we could get, which would be having the plants kind of more closely associated and letting them kind of interact together. And so different plants, let's say nitrogen fixers, do one thing, plants that form uh, mycorrhizal associations do something else. And so while we could use an appropriate exotic plant in our mix, we can't assume that that plant is necessarily gonna full, uh, fulfill any necessary function. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, it just means we can't make it that. So when we look at like ecoregions as an example, ecoregions provide us really good um, inspiration for how we would go forward. So if we were looking at something in the Ridge and Valley, we might, you know, we might approach the design in one way. If we were looking at something like a cedar glade, we might approach it in another. If we have a southeastern prairie, we might use something different. The plant assemblages allow us to tie that kind of experience to a site, right? And so I would give an example. So one of the examples I use with my students in our management class is the idea that if we have slightly acidic rains and we have a sidewalk, what we end up with is the condition of the soil near the sidewalk tends to be a little more basic than it is, let's say five or 10 feet away from that sidewalk. So if we have plants that like to grow on limestone, we can usually use those plants closer to that sidewalk, right? And they'll grow with that condition where something that's more uh, ericaceous who wants, who wants that acid isn't gonna be very happy right next to that sidewalk. And so we're using that same uh, approach in our understanding of ecology to how we approach design and management of that landscape. So if plant communities can serve as inspiration, like how does that, you know, how does that manifest itself? So here's Guadalupe Peak again, and here's a, a Texas Madrone and an alligator juniper and, and that kind of associated Chihuahuan desert grassland. And then on the right of the image, you see the designed plant community. And so in this case, they've taken species directly out of it, but not all the species. It's not a literal translation. There's an abstraction that's happened that's appropriate to the garden and the garden uh, scale. So you see the madrone against the, you know, it's clearly the, the show cave, the showpiece of this, of this garden. And you see that kind of dramatic movement of the trunk and it's been offset with the native limestone wall. But the plant material in that condition was inspired by how this plant grows in the wild. So when we think of those, you know, the kind of typical ones that come to mind, um, you know, are kind of, they're, they're kind of generic examples. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean that they're, a rock garden can be a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And so we think about rock gardens, wildflower meadows, dry river beds, woodland gardens, and so forth. We'll look at a couple of those. So the stream garden. So the image you see on the left is, is quite literally down the road from where I grew up. I spent most of my youth swimming, fishing, catching turtles and salamanders and snakes and stuff in this place called Bull Creek. It's limestone shelves, uh, spring fed, crystal clear water, very nutrient poor, um, but you know, very much, I mean, if you think about like the little river, you know, that kind of condition only, you know, this is, this is a much newer landscape than the, than the Appalachian, you know, mountains. The example to the, the right is that designed landscape where, where the idea of the spring fed creek, the limestone based creek is abstracted to fit a garden. And in this case, right, the materials cross over, but if you'll notice, there's not a direct trend, there's not a direct plant or species per species translation, which is good. So in, in, the, exa in the example on the left, we see things like sycamore. Well, sycamore might be the wrong scale for the garden. And so the live oak that's present there does the same thing the live oak does uh, in, the, in the natural condition, but it also can fill in abstractly for the sycamore and for any large tree, the, the possum haw holly is gonna be same for same. But again, you would look for uh, aesthetic qualities in that, in that native plant that would showcase best in that garden. The woodland garden is probably the, the one that's best understood and has longest been abstracted. And that's because, you know, folks, you know, have shade gardens and they're, constant, they're constantly struggling with shade gardens. My mom and dad live in Omaha, Nebraska, and my mom's arguing that I need to like design their landscape because she's got this crazy shade garden. It, but the traditional approach, the way we did it, is kind of what we see on the right. So it's been hostas, it's been a lot of plants from Asia. Um, they're beautiful, they're great, but we're not really getting the same ecological function that we get out of some of our ephemerals. And, and Eastern Tennessee is really fortunate to have a lot of native shade adapted plants. 
And so when we start to use those, again, the same, the same rules apply, right? That there, those plants operate together in a community. And when we bring that community uh, to bear in a design landscape, we can sometimes get some of those same functions. I will also happily acknowledge the fact that some of those things don't like to live just anywhere. Um, this last semester we went through and I had my students doing a lot of management on some of the rain gardens that were designed on campus. And so one of the rain gardens that was designed relied very heavily on um, Smoky Mountains ephemerals and the conditions just aren't right. There was not enough soil moisture to prevent, uh, provide for the trout lily and all the other things that they were trying to utilize there, uh, the trilliums and stuff. And so they just, they just basically disappeared from the design. So we do have to be conscientious about the fact that some things just aren't going to translate directly. And that might be where the appropriate non-native comes in and fills that space. But again, we don't want to rely entirely on non-natives just for, for, uh, for thinking that they'll, be, they'll, they'll operate the same way. The Rocky Alpine Garden, I think, is, a, is another classic example and one that, that has been utilized a lot, especially within the last you know, 30 years or so. Um, the example on the left shows kind of the density at which alpine plants can sometimes grow. The one on the right is more conducive to both a garden, but also if you'll notice there's signage. So this is kind of more almost a collection of alpine plants. Um, I'm not going to criticize the, the plant collector approach. Um, I've collected orchids and I love bonsai. And so like I have my, <laughs> I have my weakness towards that as well. But, but I would also just say that like our, our approach now uh, to contemporary uh, planting design is a lot more like what you see on the left. It is a lot denser. It is a lot more uh, naturally driven versus the kind of like um, curated collection of plants that we see on the right. And just to kind of prove that I'm not a, a complete purist, this, this um, salvia cultivar is from my grandmother's farm on the uh, Kansas-Nebraska border. And my great-grandmother planted this uh, plant and it's survived blizzards and droughts and I now have this plant in my pollinator garden here in South Knoxville and um, and I think that again like the use of appropriate plants is important this this plant does not support you know all the native insects that some of the other natives that I have in the garden do but for general pollinators this works really really well and for my little niece and for other people to come over and see bumblebees and other things like that like just covering this thing it, it serves an educational purpose as well. So we don't have to throw those out. We don't have to, we don't have to uh, feel guilty about those. We just want to be conscientious about the role they actually play. And if we need, if we need our landscapes to be more, um, more effective, we may have to make some, some adjustments into those plant palettes. So some of the benefits associated with the native plants are things like they're adapted to the local environmental conditions. So, in this case, right, we want to think very carefully about what that what that means. If we are dealing with a native plant, quote unquote, that occurs from Florida to Saskatchewan, right, where it occurs within that may matter to us. There's been some really great research done on restoration projects in Europe where they're finding that if they have isolated populations and there's a coastal population and there's a mountain population, they can't use plants from the coastal population to help re reforest their mountain populations, they won't survive. And so we want to understand there is genetic diversity in plants, even with plants that have a very wide distribution. And so ideally, we're trying to get our plants from fairly close, if possible. So um, for the Sustainable Sites Initiative, when we're doing a sites project, we're typically looking for within 200 miles, if possible. Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't, but that's kind of our goal. Um, the native plants help us increase our resiliency because, again, they've evolved in those populations. They've evolved to those drought conditions that, that you know, if, if we typically have a five-year drought, those populations have dealt with that. If we're dealing with things like flooding or blizzards or whatever, and those things happen, we're dealing with that. Again, some of the research tab that's being done right now is whether or not we are using climate models to uh, extrapolate whether or not we're moving plants in our designs further west. So for example, like, would I start utilizing things from Nashville um, here? Um, right now, I probably wouldn't. I would probably cho uh, choose to concentrate on Eastern Tennessee and the Ridge and Valley, but, but if climate models are suggesting that this is happening, are we thinking toward the future and towards the future? 
again, that's still being discussed and researched, but that's, that's kind of where that, that's happening. Plants are going to help us reduce the uh, urban heat island effect. So that's, that is a condition where um, as we increase impermeable surfaces, roads, um, parking lots, buildings, those things all absorb heat over time. And then they give that heat off over at night and we end up with essentially an island of heat. Um, if any of you have ever, you know, driven in a convertible or a motorcycle or, or whatever from like the city out into the country, you'll feel that change in that urban heat island. And our plants really help us um, address that because they help kind of keep the heat off of those impermeable surfaces. They help us regulate local climate as well as microclimates. So that could be in the terms of uh, things like windbreaks that also could be um, related to evapotranspiration and those kind of changes to our climate. And then they help us counteract things like climate change. So all plants are going to help us sequester carbon. And right now, when we think about like the discussions in urban centers, there's like a million tree movement and things like that, where they're trying to plant a lot of urban forestry. I think that's all really good. Trees do a great job, but so do our native grasses. Um, our native grasses sequester an awful lot of carbon. They're less expensive. Um, for the individual homeowner or for a municipality, and um, it's something to certainly consider. Um, the image I have taken here, this is in Chicago. This is, um, this is kind of one of the things we have to kind of acknowledge as, an, as a discipline, whether you're on the design side, the production side, the management side, we utilize chemicals quite a bit in landscape. Um, this image was taken uh, near a church, there's a school right, right by it, and this is along a sidewalk. Um, I will tell you right now, as a, a, I could not have done my restoration ecology work without access to herbicides. So I, I, I've got in here that it's, we're looking to reduce, not necessarily eliminate. If we can eliminate, great, but reduction is okay. So native plants allow us to reduce that reliance on pesticides, fertilizers, and herbicides. For the most part, our native plants don't want to be fertilized. Um, and in fact, we can often speed up their decline and senescence very, very quickly by fertilizing. And so it's best not to. Um, they help us promote biodiversity, whether that's allelic, so like genetic diversity, but also species richness. Um, again, providing wildlife habitat and increasing uh, pollinator like habitat and health. So again, you know, it's, it's important to kind of understand the difference between how plants work. So if we see something that's got a tubular red flower, we're like, OK, hey, you know, hummingbirds love it. But the truth is, it may not produce the same level of nectar that they're really looking for. And so something like the salvia does a really great job. And so how, you know, how we understand the plant and how the plant works in relation to the larger system is important. And then the educational benefit. Um, so one of the things that's, you know, that I think is, is kind of important to understand is that like plants that reflect an ecosystem and are planted in assemblages that reflect an ecosystem, give us that additional educational piece. So those of us in plant sciences and who are interested in gardening and horticulture automatically like plants. Like there's, you know, we love plants. And so we're just like, oh, everyone's gonna love plants and everyone's gonna wanna learn about plants. But the reality is that like at a point, teaching about the ecosystem is also really cool. So the, the little girl right there is one of my nieces and she's particularly taken with this feather grass as are a lot of people who get to see feather grass when it's blowing around in the wind. And I think that part of what's really neat about this is not just the plant, but it's also when you move the, when you move the grass back and you're starting to look at like all the, the critters that are utilizing that coverage, that's really, so the educational benefit of native plants is really significant. Native plants and installation is actually pretty easy. Um, this is a project that my wife and I did in El Paso for a client who retired from White Sands Missile Range. Um, the community she moved into is primarily Fort Bliss soldiers. And so folks go on deployment often. And so when you look at the landscape, the landscape reflects the fact that nobody will be there for extended periods of time to take care of the landscape. So you see gravel and parking lot. And so in this case, what happens is the, the, the standard building procedure is they, they clear the site, they use uh, construction fill, they, they cover the construction fill with impermeable plastic. So it's not like weed barrier, it's impermeable plastic, and then throw gravel on top of it. In this case, in some cases, the gravel is 10 inches deep or so. And so what we went in and did was we utilized plants that didn't require any additional supplemental soil amendments. We used plants that wouldn't want any fertilizer, 
and that once established wouldn't require any supplemental water and could take the reflective heat of the gravel that came off of it. We did this for like an incredibly low budget. I think, I think it was like two grand for the budget. So, I mean, it was really, really low. But the client was looking for the Chihuahuan Desert reproduced in her front yard. So what she saw on White Sands Missile Range, she wanted to reproduce in her front yard. And that's what we were able to do in one year. We were able to get that. Unfortunately, with COVID and El Paso being hit as hard as it has, have not been able to get back out and see kind of how things have progressed since. But that gives you kind of an, an indication about how easy it is, in most cases, to install native plants. One of the hard parts about native plants is availability, right? So um, in places like that are, are have very low rainwater, um, there's a lot more availability even at Lowe's and Home Depot of native plants because those plants grow well there. But we we're pretty fortunate because we're able to utilize um, some, some native nurseries here in Eastern Ten uh, Tennessee and we have access to some really good seed sources. Well, one of the other issues with native plants again is maintenance. And, and part of the reason why I'm showing you some of these examples from more arid places because I think things show up really well uh, when you have 48 inches of precip, things can kind of cheat and they can kind of limp along. But when you're when you've got 18 or less, or even seven inches of rain, things show up really quickly. So this is the that feather grass that I showed you before, and this is on a Texas Tech campus. So this is on the Llano Estacado, and in this case, what happened is folks at Grounds Maintenance had read that you need to cut back um, ornamental grasses, you know, three or four inches to three or four inches. And what's happened here is you have a very windy, very cold winter. And when they cut it back, they, they essentially scalp it. And so, you know, typically I think all of us have seen how people treat crepe myrtles. Um, well, this is, I think this is probably the same level of butchery. What happens is they, they scalp it. Well, then they scalp it early because it looks, you know, it's dormant. And so they don't want it to look untidy. So they scalp it and then the crown freezes. And so what you end up with over time is a lot of dead within the crown and they never really respond. So here, here's the problem. Here's the problem I would, I would give you is like, where, what do you do now? So if we were going for sustainability, the grass that we planted here in this case that we used in our design is really good at not using water. So, okay, great. Um, if you notice on, in the image, the drip irrigation is on the surface, which is kind of a weird thing they do out there. But, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily need the water. So, okay, that's good. But our maintenance practices are such that we've basically ruined the design and ruined the plants. And now our only option really to make it look good or go back to the vision that was originally sold to the client is to yank all of that out and replant it. And that is not a very sustainable approach. So we have to kind of combine our use of plants with our understanding of how those plants need to be managed and maintained. And then always be kind of considering about how we do that in such a way that they will continue to be, um, you know, resilient and, and sustainable. So on the same campus, in this example, they left it alone. So this is what that feather grass would look like when it's fully dormant. And part of that has to do with the fact that this is associated with this sculpture. So it was protected from grounds maintenance, like cutting it down to the ground because essentially part of the, the, artist vision was that that grass would stay the way it is. Okay, so this is what, you know, part of what we have to do um, is educate folks on like, okay, the plant you chose, this is what it's supposed to look like versus this is what you want it to look like and it won't ever do that. And so this, I think that's one of our, our toughest, kind of our toughest communication points right now is like, how do we make that part clear to folks? So we'll look at a, at a case study. And this is the reason we're gonna look at this case study is because again, this is very reflective of like a, a decision and a movement towards uh, conservation of native plants and design landscapes. And so this is the Ian and Lucy or Lucy and Ian garden at the um, Wildflower Center, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. So this is all native plants utilized in a uh, botanic garden condition the Wildflower Center, along with the American Society of Landscape Architects and the U.S. Botanic Garden, were the authors of the Sustainable Sites Initiative, and this was a sites project. So when we look at the way it's laid out, right, we're still seeing things like drifts, we're still seeing blocks, we're seeing like um, 
matrix planting. So we, we don't have to give up our traditional approaches necessarily, but you'll notice there's Maximilian sunflower, there's switchgrass, um, there's uh, Ilex vomitoria and Eastern red cedar all present in that, but they're all utilized in such a way that we're getting those same basic design principles um, utilized to, to increase the uh, experiential quality of that. Um, one, of the crit one of the kind of critiques that goes back and forth between ecological landscape design folks and like turf folks is like the use of turf. In this case, they use turf. They use turf, um, a product that they created called Habit Turf, which is a combination of buffalo, uh, buffalo grass and blue brahma. It's a no-mow grass. Essentially, if you have to cut it at all, you cut it once a year. You, put, you never put fertilizer on it. Um, you do have to weed it the first couple of years, but once it's filled in, it's pretty aggressive about not uh, about fighting it back against weeds. But the other piece about it is it still supports things like skippers and other ecosystem services that something like fescue might not. Um, the use of limestone, native plants, things like this. In this case, so this is for children. So they've created this like grotto. They've created this whole, uh, this whole playscape utilizing native materials. Again, going back to the idea of sustainable landscape design, which doesn't necessarily mean it's just the plants, right? It's also the materials. Um, and what I kind of want to point out here is that the, the plants that are here, we have in Eastern Tennessee, or at least we have a species of in Eastern Tennessee and the materials are, are relevant. So, you know, the use of limestone, the use of bushy blue stem, giant cone flower, um, there is a, there is a, uh, you know, there's the Ilex, the Ilex decidua that's there, the possum holly, you know, we have Ilex here, um, the Mexican plum that's there, we have prunus here. Um, what's interesting about the way this is done is that the, 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 blue, the bushy blue stems are allowed to be up tall, right? And as you notice, the giant cone flower is kind of down and small, it doesn't have to stand up. What's going to happen is as the cone flower starts to showcase, they'll be able to cut back the blue stem. The, the cone flowers will showcase nicely. And then as they start to senesce, you can cut the cone flowers back and the blue stem will then fill in. So from a sustainability standpoint, you always have some sort of visual interest happening and impact. Um, when we think about something like a cedar glade where we have thin soils and limestone, you know, there are, you know, we wouldn't use the same plant species we see here, but we could use the same approaches. So here we have things like copper mallow, the feather grass, red yucca, um, things like that. And again, we might not want to use those plants here, but we might, we might be able to take inspiration from that and then utilize the materials we have available to us here to kind of achieve that same impact. When we look at things like spider wart, um, again, we see the deciduous holly in the back, right? And that showcase is really nice with the architecture. So one of the things we want to be thinking about when we're doing landscape design with native plants and we're thinking about sustainability is how that is experienced from the inside, from the way we walk around the landscape. Um, you know, what does it smell like? What is it, does it have a, you know, what does it sound like? And think about all those experiential qualities that we've always thought about when we did landscape design. We've always thought about plants um, and planting design, but then bring it to like maybe a heightened component because again, like native plants have a certain like uh, weedy quality that some people don't like. And so, you know, there, there may be ways where we can like kind of like offset that fact uh, without necessarily having to result to, to native ours. In the example to the right, you see there are native ours being used, right? So, you know, uh, cultivars of native plants that have been um, uh, ad uh, like bred for certain qualities. So like the echinacea for, for color or things like that, all of which are, are viable options within the garden, but again, um, if you're familiar at all with Doug Ptolemy's work, um, there is some research to suggest that they don't always uh, fill the same, the same niche or the same role. Um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't use them. It just means we need to be aware of that and, and offset that if we're going to. Um, I put this image in here because I think this is important. For a lot of us who really love landscapes and love gardens and garden design, you know, we are always wanting to take pictures um, when they're beautiful. Like we're always wanting to see them when everything's gorgeous. Um, I want to really encourage folks to take pictures when everything's dormant, when things have been cut back, um, whether you're taking photos, whether you're sketching, whatever you're doing, because I think this really shows us the bones of the design and it helps us really um, 
you know, draw inspiration or even criticize design because we're able to really see it for what it is. The plant that's present right there, kind of at the at the top of that um, that stone wall, is a plant called Nolina, and Nolina is one of I'm pretty sure I've said everything's my favorite plant, but Nolina is a, a a really great plant. It looks like an ornamental grass. It's more closely related to a yucca. It puts out a flower spike like a yucca. They sometimes call it bear grass. It's a really great, it's a really great plant, really drought adapted. In Eastern Tennessee, right, one of the things that my wife and I are experimenting with here, even on our property in South Knox, is the idea of utilizing some of these more arid plants on post-industrial sites, where again, the, the soil quality is really poor. Um, there's a lot of impermeability. There's a lot of heat generated by all the impermeability and whether or not some of these plants can serve some ecosystem services in those post-industrial sites. Once the sites are, are mitigated, is it possible to then convert those back over to something more native? Those are all possibilities. But again, that's more like kind of research areas. Um, I'm gonna leave you with a couple of plants that I'm particularly interested in. So this is tag alder and I, I was really pretty unfamiliar with this plant um, until fairly recently. I picked up a couple of Tennessee naturescapes. Uh, but what's really cool about this plant is, 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 almost, is almost the reason why people won't usually plant it, right? And that is because it attracts uh, aphids and mealybugs and stuff like that. But what it does also, which is really cool, is it, it basically serves as a larval food host for our only carnivorous Lepidoptera. And so the larva of the harvester butterfly eats the aphids, which is really cool. And then the harvester butterfly eats the nectar or the honeydew from the aphids. So by planting tag alder, which works really well in a swampy or boggy site, or if you're gonna stabilize like a, a riparian area, um, is great. But like, it may not be the most beautiful tree because it's gonna have bugs on it, but it's also gonna be a really great, you know, tree to add to your pollinator or your butterfly garden, right? And so understanding that system is kind of fascinating to me. Um, another plant that I, that I absolutely love is prairie drop seed. So Sporobolus. I love that plant for, for lots of different reasons, but one is that um, our, native, our native prairie grasses do such a really great job at helping us like improve our soils. Um, they also provide a lot of cover. And so while we might think about this in terms of granivorous birds or mammals are gonna eat the seeds or as nesting material, one of the things that does really well is it also provides cover. And that cover allows us to, to form connections between essentially habitats. And so when we think about rewilding efforts, typically we think about rewilding efforts with really large mammals or bird flyways or things like that. But I think that like if we we're starting to think about smaller uh, organisms, like we can use our, our residential landscapes, our park landscapes, our um, university landscapes, our, our schools and such as a way to make these like um, these habitat corridors out of that sort of thing. And so this is the rain garden outside my office um, at ELL, right next to the UT Gardens. And you can see that, and I think you can see in the image that it's, it's raining and that it's functioning really well. And I think the reason I want to bring this in, this is before my students uh, went in and, and did some management, especially on the woody encroachment that's coming in there. So you see the, the tulip poplar and there's an elm in the back. All that's been cleared out, but but what's really cool about this is the function. Like I think I think most folks get what a rain garden does and are really interested in rain gardens, and so that function they they kind of get. But I would argue that if we utilize native plants throughout our landscape, even if they're not the main piece of our landscape, we're starting to bring those kinds of functions back into the rest of our garden, and something that's kind of fun and interesting. I would also point out that the UT gardens are beautiful, and that people come from all over the state to come see them. But the number of people I see over here taking pictures of this uh, rain garden is just unreal. And um, so people, people like native landscapes too. And so we, we need to not be afraid to use them um, and, and I think explore them more fully. So I'll leave you, uh, you know, I'll take questions or whatever. I'll leave you with this, this image of bald cypress. The reason why um, I want this image here is because I just, there, there's something really um, experiential about the idea of walking around on a cinnamon carpet. It's not crunchy. It doesn't make a lot of noise. It's just kind of beautiful. And thinking that like native plants do have an ornamental function in our landscapes if we use them correctly. Very good, Michael. I appreciate you coming today. It was very good. I'm sure there'll, there were, there's questions on the chat there that 
everyone says excellent presentation. One in particular was, what are all these plants called? Some of the names you went through pretty quick. Is there a list or some place? Um, no, but I could send one if you'd like. If you send it to me, sure. I certainly get it to everyone. Okay. Because we do these every every week and I've got a registration database for I think everybody on here. Sure. And you know, and, and again, I used I used some plants that are, are not from this area, but I think they were primarily to showcase um, you know, the kind of the bigger, the bigger, you know, the bigger question or the bigger pieces. Um, but you know, I, I'll be honest, I mean, I'm, I'm growing some of that same stuff here in, in South Knox and it's growing fine. So, you know, I don't think you should necessarily be scared. I mean, it kind of goes, I guess it kind of goes against what I'm saying about the whole native plant thing. But at the same time, I think, you know, we are all kind of plant nerds and, and we kind of want to, we want to have plants and, and look at stuff and learn new stuff. So I'll share that with you for sure. There's a big debate. I don't know if you know Carol Reese real good. Um, she's our extension agent in West Tennessee. Have you met Carol? I have, yes. She's got her, her points of view. And yes, she does. That's great. Um, I'd, I'd love to have a discussion between you and and D Doug Talmy and <laughs> Carol Reese all in one big yeah, thing. That would, that, would be, that would be interesting. That would be fun. <laughs> exactly. But I think everyone has their points to are well made and maybe we just don't know all the reason or all the science behind it or you know we know what a native or we think we know what a native plant is but um don arnold let's see i grew up near san francisco love to look and yeah, we've some of our master gardeners come from all over especially sure. from in knoxville and we i've got a group right now in chattanooga okay yeah and they so, see a lot of things from all over and they they want them they want something here when they retire sure. here. Yeah, so I, I see Don uh, Arnold's question about uh, for an Asian garden. Um, so that same client that we had in El Paso, I just I met with her, um, did some sketching work with her. So she does uh, Urasenke tea ceremony. And so we're doing a, a, a um, tea house in the back. So she's Japanese. So again, the front of the house is all Chihuahua Desert. The back of the house will all be... Um, like tea garden but then the interpretation of like how so through our conversations and through a sketching just kind of trying to figure out what that means we're still trying to figure out what what a tea garden in the Chihuahuan desert looks like right you know so it's clearly not going to have you know black necessarily it's probably not going to have maple necessarily but what can and what is the essence of like the dewy path that leads to this you know this tea house and that sort of thing um, one of the plants that I think works really well, I mean, Central Texas was really good because we had, um, you know, a number of different hollies. We had a number of different, you know, the live oaks. We, we had a lot of picturesque plants that would naturally grow there that lent themselves to like Japanese gardens that lent themselves to that kind of inspiration. But I think something like um, uh, Yopan holly, like to sit like uh, Ilex vomitoria is a good example where it has a really small leaf. It takes pruning really well. So if you wanted to do like karikomi, like that style of azalea, um, that would be a possibility there. Um, there are some more species that I think are worth looking into, um, depending on where you're located in, uh, um, in Eastern Tennessee um, or, or Middle Tennessee or, or what have you. My, I think I understood this to be Eastern Tennessee. But am I wrong about that? That's right. Okay, all right, good. So, you know, depending on how close you are, say to the mountains and how ericaceous your soil is, the, the ability to get to some of the, the native azaleas and some of the, the native rhododendrons um, or even things like mountain laurel would give you access to that kind of um, picturesque quality. And again, what I would do, and this has kind of been my approach. So my, my actual interest in plants began with bonsai and Japanese gardens. And so that's what made me want to be a landscape architect in the first place. So, um, so one of the things that, that I've looked at all along is the, if you think about the inspiration of something like a Japanese garden in the very first place, is it's representative of the mountain uh, flora of outside Kyoto, right? So, I mean, if you look at the old scrolls, that's actually what it's referencing. So if we take that, the essence of what that is and apply it to the areas we live in and we, and we break it down to that simple essence, it's a native, it, it's a highly abstracted, highly managed native landscape. So if you go to Japan, so when I went to Japan, they're not using 
you know, North American plants typically. They're using Japanese plants that are native. They're not using cultivars primarily. They're using species types often. They do use things like um, grafting techniques and other things like that, horticultural techniques to achieve this, but they very much embrace that, that native plant thing within the idea of ornamental horticulture. We had the advantage, we, you know, Japan was, was closed off for so long. We have had the advantage to bring horticultural curiosities to the United States for a really long time. And so it's really hard to like start to, to whittle that down. But I think there are, um, I don't mean to spend so much time on the one question, but I, I think there are a lot of possibilities there depending on what your site conditions are like. I was, I missed the first couple minutes because of the other meeting. Did you mention the gardens and invite everybody up there to come and see it? No, but well, not till the, the end, but by all means come up and if, and if I'm there, come see me. I'm in ELL one, uh, 114, I guess, right across from 117. Um, I'll have a mask. You know? <laughs> It'll be fine. I'm teaching face-to-face -face this whole semester, so I'll be there. On, I'll be on campus every day. Well, maybe things will open up this summer and we'll get up there for a field day. But yeah. I get up there a couple times a year, and I always check out the rain garden. It's uh, fabulous. It's not, yeah, well, you know, it's not huge, but it's, it's beautiful. We've got one down here that the Master Gardeners did over, over at the food bank. And okay. we've had Andrea Ludwig down here and yeah. had some crews down. Well, we're working on a, we're working on a publication for uh, rain gardens right now, Andrea and I, and some students. Um, so it'll just be, a, it'll be like a one sheeter, but we're going to work on a series from that. Um, she and I are also doing some work on floating treatment wetlands. So floating, like floating design wetlands. Um, and so we'll, we'll have some of that stuff out in the future, I hope. Uh, we're talking about the UT gardens in Knoxville up on campus. Yeah. A lot of times we'll go up there for field days, but it's probably just as well to go up there on your own and walk around the gardens. They're, they're open. Yeah. Yeah. And they have been the whole time. So we're, we're happy to see folks up there and, and use them. Um, yeah. It's been, it, it's, it's helped a lot to be really honest, to go out and just spend, just spend some time and outside is pretty helpful. So. Um, Michael, uh, Rod McKittrick, I was just wondering, at the beginning, you talked about uh, Texas uh, DOT using natives along roadways. And I was just wondering, at the beginning of all that, did, was there a lot of negative comments? or Because I've seen some of this in the East, and people want it mowed. I mean, I was just wondering how it went. Sure. I think, so no, that's a, that's a really great question. I think in the beginning, um, what... I think there was some debate. So one of the things that happens, if you think about the way the way uh, TxDOT manages it, they keep it mown pretty short until like you get to a, a you know right about a right about spring, right? So you have enough you have enough light to hit there, and so the forbs are going to come up. So it's a really forb heavy landscape. Gotcha. One of the problems with that is that you know deer love forbs, and so you end up with a ton of deer on the roadways. And so there was a lot of there was a, a lot of discussion about like okay so by designing it this way, we're actually increasing the potential for collisions as a result of this. And kind of what happened is, um, you know, that the debate kind of started to shift and they started realizing that we're making a lot of money off of tourists coming down here to take pictures. And it's kind of become, to be really honest, like every little kid who grows up in Texas gets a picture when they're like one in the blue bonnets. Like it's like the thing you do. And if you don't have kids, you take your dog and get your picture of your dog in the blue bonnets. And if it's not a dog, it's a cat or whatever. And so I think that like, I think that kind of argument has shifted a lot. And again, with, to be really honest, and part of the reason why I brought in the pictures of the, the Labor Johnson Wildflower Center, and, I, and I've done that on every presentation I've given. So whether it's to Extension or anybody else, one of the things I, I when I came here and did my initial interview, um, with the department was like, Hey, look, you know, I think, I think every state should have its wildflower center. I think every state should have its like its native plant conservation and utilization and design space kind of thing. And one of the things that happened with the wildflower center, which made it really easy for us to sell clients on the idea of using things like native plants was it was such a great example. And so now you have ranchers who are converting over part of their like part of their pasture area along these roadways to wildflowers as well. So they, they're still grazing cattle, but now like as you drive through, you know, the hill country, if you're going over by Lano or someplace like that, it's really famous. I don't know if you've ever seen the, the video with Pete Udolph where he's coming through the United States and he's going through, you know, 
you're saying yeah, okay yeah. and he's that's that is lano so he's right over in that area and and i think he even comments that it's like a little artificial but it is a little artificial because people are now taking it and running with it and they're saying oh you know this combination of like you know liatris and prairie paintbrush and blue bonnet is so beautiful let's put it out there now you're starting to see a lot of it and so i think nice. that helped answer that question yeah. you know that concern yep yeah. uh, thank you that, uh, that's great Anybody else have any questions? Let's see. I think Suzanne asked, how do, how do these ideas adapted if you live in a development where the landscaping needs to be relatively similar, at least in the front yard? So, okay, so that's a, that's a really good one. And, and HOAs can be great or can be really hard. It depends on, on kind of what they're, how literal they are. So for example, if it's, if you're looking at something like a hedge, right, you have to have a hedge. Does it have to be a boxwood hedge or could it be something like a, a holly hedge, like an, an island? Um, and then can, can we utilize a native that will do the exact same thing? It's going to have a, the same, probably the same management requirements, but it'll do, it'll actually function in the same way. In some cases, what we, what we've done with a client in uh, in an HOA where they're really, really strict about that was the, the backyard had the freedom to be everything it needed to be. So it was almost the opposite of what we were doing with that client in El Paso, where her front yard was Chihuahuan desert, wild native, and the back becomes something that's a little bit more manicured and managed. You'd almost just reverse that. I think, I think again, depending on like how engaged you are with it or how serious you want to be with it, it could be just you know, you have a series of plants that are present along with the stuff that's kind of more normative for the community. Um, and that just is looking at like what the covenances are and then, and then sticking to it. Just remember though, that those, those can be legally binding. And so you don't want to do anything that's going to, to jeopardize um, both your relationship with your neighbors and your HOA, but also maybe fine you or cost you money. Right. What are some sources to learn about bonsai? Um, okay, so uh, there is there is a guy who's got a, a, a nursery ASAN out in Nashville who did his uh, he did his apprenticeship in Osaka, I think. So um, he's he was trained in Japan. He's got a, a nursery. I think they teach he teaches online classes and stuff like that. Um, there is a Knoxville Bonsai Society, although, I, like I said, I've only been here a little over a year now, and COVID kind of cut into about half of that. So. <laughs> I haven't even been to a meeting yet. Um, there, you know, my interest, my interest in bonsai started when I was like the youngest member of the Austin Bonsai Society. And so like, I was like an, this like punk rock kid in high school with like tattoos and showing up and there are all these people who are really nice to me, which is really awesome. And so um, I just was always interested in native plants being utilized in that same way. Um, but those would, those would be really good resources to like find out more about, like about that. There's, there are a whole bunch of, um, like nowadays there's a whole bunch of opportunities via you know, videos or from, from individuals, again, who've trained in Japan, who offer classes, or even like they have, I think a membership video series where they're teaching it distant, which would be really great now with COVID to learn some of that stuff. And we've got a nice uh, bonsai club in, in Hamilton County. They used to meet once a month until COVID. And so I, I think it'll probably strike back up. There was probably 50 members, I think. Oh, wow. That's sure. awesome. Yeah, it's a pretty yeah. good, pretty good um, way to find to find out. Again, I want to thank you again for uh, coming down and speaking to us today, virtually. It's been a pleasure to meet you online. Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity, and again, my um, please feel free to reach out to me anytime. If I can ever be of any assistance or any kind of resource, let me know. I'd be happy to. Thank you. Appreciate it. You bet. Bye bye.